Hi everybody, I'm Dan Wells. I write horror, fantasy, and science fiction, and I talk about games on the internet. Today I want to talk about RuneQuest, role-playing in Glorantha, which is a fantasy game designed by Greg Stafford, the same luminary game designer who did Pendragon, which is one of my top three games of all time. Uh, role-playing in uh, Glorantha, RuneQuest, is similar to Pendragon in a lot of ways, especially this current edition of it. Uh, if you are a fan of his style of game, which I am, this one is going to hit you right square in the chops and scratch all your itches. Uh, let's take a look at some of it. I initially, I admit, was not super excited about RuneQuest way back when I first heard about it uh, because I had heard that it had, you know, that it was long and that it was complicated and then it had a lot of things. And to be fair, it's complicated. Uh, the character sheet is four pages long and way too small at that. Uh, but it's absolutely worth it once you get into it. Let's have a look at some of this stuff, okay? That's the book. This is the character sheet. This is page one of the character sheet. Uh, and so you can see it's got a hit location thing here. These are sort of your attributes. These are the runes of Rune Quest. Uh, and a lot of what you can do will be defined by how strong you are in the different runes, your runic affinities for elements and for powers. You also have characteristics, which are also kind of sort of like attributes, uh, but different. And these are a little more recognizable. In fact, Strength, Con, Dex, Cha, those are all exactly what you think they are, even int, uh, size and power. So, the, uh, then you have passions, and the passions are a system very similar to the one in Pendragon, where it will be something like love for your family, loyalty to your clan, hatred of a rival clan, things like that, uh, emotions and connections and relationships that will define a lot of how you act. And so how much loyalty you have for your clan, or how much hatred you have for another clan or something like that, another kingdom that came in and squished all your ancestors, that can absolutely change the way that you react to things and can even give you bonuses in combat. Uh, if you are trying to defend someone you love or attack someone you hate, there's a lot of different passions and a lot of variability in the system, and I like it a lot. Uh, let's take a look then. Also, every single uh, character sheet has this section here. Every character has magic. This is very not like D&D, where magic is the domain of just a couple of wizards. This is not the Tolkien-esque Gandalf has magic and everyone else just has a sword. Um, this is... Rather than being based on a Tolkien-esque fantasy, this is more like Gilgamesh or Hercules or something like that. Uh, kind of Bronze Age, mythic gods and that sort of thing. So magic is everywhere. Everyone will be part of a cult, which is basically just a small religion uh, because this is Bronze Age. And so every character has access to certain magic. You might not be very good at it, and you can absolutely still specialize your character into a kind of standard character class. You can be a little more magic-y if you want to play a wizard. You can be a little more sneaky if you want to play a rogue. A little tougher if you want to play a fighter or something like that. Uh, but it doesn't have a normal class system at all. Let's look at page two. <laughs> See what I mean about this being a complicated system? That's the skills. This is whole page is just the skills and then some equipment at the bottom. Okay, and furthermore, you see right up here, um, every skill includes a couple of, like, what the base chance is. It's a percentile system. So right here, climb starts at 40. Everyone in the world can climb a wall with a 40% chance of success. But depending on your attributes and characteristics that we saw on the other page, you will have a modifier for every category. So if you have, for example, a very high dex, you'll have a modifier for every agility skill. And that might raise your base climbing chance to 45, or even 50 if you're super good at it. 
Uh, if you are really good at charisma, you will have a bonus to communication skills. Int and intelligence will get you a bonus to knowledge skills, and so on and so on. Okay? And so you have all of these. And then on top of that, the tribe that you come from, the nation that you come from, will determine a lot of that as well. And they will give you different skill bonuses. So if you are from Old Tarsh, that gives you different skills than if you come from Sartar or the Lunar Kingdoms and different things like that. So let's, before we go on to the next page, let's have a look at that map, okay? This is the map of not all of Glorantha, but the part of it called Dragon's Pass, which is the main area where almost everything takes place. Okay? It's kind of named after, right here in the middle, there's this giant mountain called Kiro Fen that's something like 12 kilometers tall. That's enormous. That's far taller than Everest. And it's just this giant spire in the middle of everything. It's a very mythic world. Dragons in this world are several kilometers long, so you don't want to mess with them. Um, and all around it, you can see here's the Kingdom of Tarsh, down here is Esrolia, here in the middle is Sartar, over here is Prax, and things like that. And so there are uh, five or six different places you can choose to be from. And there is also a huge plains area over here, which will break down even further because there's several different nomads that are defined by what they ride. So if you want to be a nomad who rides a bison, that's going to be very different from a nomad who rides an antelope versus a nomad who rides a high llama, and so on. Uh, and so all of these different groups that you choose, that is going to change, again, what skills you have and what skills you're good at. Then whatever occupation you have is also going to change that uh, and going to give you some extra bonuses to certain skills. And unlike a class system where you defined by a adventuring style, it really is an occupational system. You're as likely to be a farmer as you are a warrior. And there are herders, and there are tradesmen, and there are all kinds of things like that. Um, now, I just said tradesman instead of tradesperson. It's worth pointing out that Glorantha, as a world, very specifically and deliberately does not follow the gender norms that we typically follow here on Earth. Uh, it recognizes a number of different genders. I think four sexes and six to eight genders uh, are listed in the book during character creation. Uh, women and men are essentially equal. Uh, there's nothing stopping someone from any of those genders from being any of the occupations or serving any of the roles in the society, which is really cool and which is a nice change from Pendragon, one of the only things I dislike about Pendragon is that it is difficult to play a female character because of the way the game is designed around knights and ladies. Uh, RuneQuest does not have that issue. Uh, so there you go. And if that bothers you, just ignore it. It's your game. But it's there for people who want it, and that's awesome because hooray. Anyway, uh, so we looked at the map. That map plays a big part of character creation and a big part of who your character is because as befits the Greg Stafford gaming style, who your father was, who your grand, your parents and your grandparents, they affect everything that you do. And so there's a place in here to put in your grandparents and all your aunts and uncles, your siblings, whether they're alive or married, um, you know, what all of these different things, how they all relate to each other. Um, all of that plays a part. And here's the final page of the character sheet, which is the Adventurer Background Worksheet, which includes family history. Now see over here where it's marked by year? Part of character creation involves starting all the way back when your grandfather or grandmother was born and then working your way up through the history. And it's not every single year, but there are key years in the history of Glorantha that are going to affect what happened to your family, and that in turn is going to affect what happened to you, okay? It is gonna give you different things. If your 
grandmother fought in a battle and was killed by, you know, a certain kingdom, then you're likely to still have a strong hatred for that kingdom two generations later. If your father, you know, lost his farm in a horrible plague or a horrible winter or something, then you might not be a farmer anymore, even though that's your heritage, because everything is gone. And so there's a lot of history tied up in that. We're going to take a look at character creation right now, because I think it is super duper cool. Let's find it. The adventurer section. So the first thing you do is you choose your homeland. This is what I was talking about before. Sartar, Esrolia, the Grey's Lands, which includes several different tribes. Prax, or no, Prax is the one that includes the tribes. Bison, High Lama, Impala, uh, Poljoni, which is kind of like a uh, zebra, I think. And then Sable Riders, which may be there. Oh no, they're the antelopes. Lunar Tarsh, Old Tarsh, and so on. And there, you're going to have different passions, and you're going to have different everything based on which kingdom, which tribe you start in. Next comes this part. Now, you can skip the family history if you want, if you're doing a one-shot, if you're doing a convention game. However, knowing the background of your character really helps get you into the mood and mindset that makes RuneQuest such a fascinating game. So I do recommend that you start. And the way this is simple, let's say that we are going to start with Sartar, okay? Where was that one? That's kind of the default homeland for adventurers, it says. Not everyone has to start there, but that's what they recommend. So we're going to start with Sartar. We're going to go through here. In the year 1561, your grandparent, whichever one you choose to follow, father or, or, or mother, was born in this year. And then in 1582, something important happened. This king did this stuff, and all these things happened. And so what you do is you roll a d20. If you're from Esrolia or Prax, you subtract five from it. If you're from Grayslands, Old Tarsh, or Sartar, you add five to it, and then you see what happens. And that determines whether or not you are at this Battle of Grizzly Peak. And if you are, then you roll on this, and that gives you other things. And it might be that you were also at this other battle of Aldachur, and so then you roll on that. And then you go through year by year, 1597, 1602, 1603, and 4. And each time, depending on which homeland you're from, you will start rolling and you'll find out maybe your grandparent died in battle or maybe they died of some other cause uh, there. I think we passed the uh, other random death table. Where's that? Death of other causes. Yeah, random causes of death. Some of the tables will say, you didn't die in battle, but you did die. Roll on this one. And then you'll find out that your grandparent was killed in a feud with another clan or killed by spirits or unknown cause just disappeared. These are all fun story ideas in addition to this kind of hereditary legacy. And then you get into, um, there's a section here for boons, random boons, good things maybe happened to your father or to you or your mother or whoever it is. And so these go in to building that entire history. Uh, as a sample, getting ready for this review, I built a character just to show off what it can do. Um, and actually, I bet I could pull that up right now. Let's find it. I made a guy from Old Tarsh. Check this guy out. Okay. We are going to shrink it down. Yay for this dude. Okay, so here on the back, uh, I randomly rolled that my grandparents were farmers. Okay, and I decided that uh, I'm going to follow my grandfather and then my father. Uh, this guy's a very patrilineal dude. And both of them were farmers. And so he fought in this battle and, you know, he survived. He lived through it. Hooray. Then he defended this city, but he ended up looting it, which I thought was really funny. And he got, and, and you know, it doesn't say that he got anything special. He just got a bunch of stuff. And then later on, you know, my father, basically, he was boring. He didn't fight in any battles. He just tended the farm every year. Uh, but then there was a great winter that almost killed everyone. And then when we got down to me here at the end, uh, one thing said, nearly killed by the Aldriyami. Those are the elves in this world. And so 
Um, a lot of my family did die. My character almost died, and so he has a passion of hatred for the Aldriami. Uh, then the next year I rolled this thing that said, Given a family heirloom, an ingot of iron from my grandfather. Well, you know what that connected to in my head? This thing that he plundered from this other city here in Sartar. And so I was able to put that in and say maybe this was an amazing thing that he, you know, got and that had been passed down and then he gave it to me. Why did he give it to me instead of to somebody else? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, there's some other things we did. Uh, let's take a look back on this previous page. There are tables where you can create your family. So I had a bunch of aunts and uncles and then I had, you know, some siblings, but there are also tables to roll on and find out who's alive and who's dead. Both my older siblings are dead. So why did that heirloom pass to me? Because I was the only one left. Why was the only one left? Well, it said right there in my family history that I was nearly killed by this raid of Aldriami. So I decided this character lost all his family and the farm in this horrible raid, and I was one of the only people left. And so I took this family heirloom, which is an ingot of iron, and one of his goals, this Bronze World Society, uh, he's going to go and get this in iron ingot forged into one of the best swords in the entire world. Or maybe an axe, because he fights with an axe. So whereas everyone else is a farmer, my guy's a bandit, because that raid killed his family. And so that changed a lot of things. It, uh, you know, he had a little bit of farmer heritage. He does have a 90% love for family after all the bonuses were added up. But, you know, he's got a hate for the Aldriami and all these other things. So doing this whole family history section, even though a lot of it doesn't even give you mechanical benefits, gives you incredible story and background to your character. This character ended up as someone who intensely loves their family and will do anything to help them, including becoming a bandit, because now, you know, my older siblings are dead, but a lot of my family, including my grandparents, are all still alive. Someone's got to support them, and we don't have a farm anymore, so he had to become a bandit so that he could go out and, you know, take what they can no longer make for themselves. So there's all this wonderful story that this character creation system helps you do. And I love that. Anyway, um, the uh, game system, like I said, is basically just percentile. You roll the 2d10s and that tells you how well you do on something. Uh, the combat system is pretty... I don't want to say that it's smooth. It's easy, but it's complex. Okay? Um, for example, anytime you attack, there are five different ways that that could go. A critical hit, a special hit, a normal hit, a fail, and a fumble. Now, the person who is trying to defend themselves can dodge, a critical dodge, a special dodge, a normal dodge, a fail, and a fumble, which means there's actually a table, where is it? <laughs> a five by five table to determine what happens in every attack in this game. Uh, this is absolutely the kind of thing that will get easier the more you go through it. Uh, you know, you'll get to the point where, honestly, most attacks are going to be normal and most parries are going to be normal, and so you're going to be kind of in this area the whole time anyway. Uh, but it is a system that does its best to simulate a lot of things and abstract other things. There's actually three kinds of damage if you get a critical or special strike using an impaling weapon, like a spear or a bow and arrow, that does a different kind of special damage than if you got a critical strike with a crushing weapon, like a hammer, or a slashing weapon, like a sword. And there are even what's called... Um, I can't remember what they're called. A sword is a special weapon that can be used slashing or impaling. It's called like touch and cut, hack and cut. Anyway. Um, it's a complicated combat system, but once you use it, it gets simpler and simpler. Also, while each individual hit requires a lot of calculation, combat itself is abstracted to the point that you're not going to be doing a lot of hits. Uh, and combat is dangerous enough that you're going to want to avoid it as much as you can 
anyway because you don't want to die. Uh, anyway, it's it's a very different combat system than you've played before, uh, but I do think that it has a lot going for it, and I love it. I wouldn't want to play it without this table or the GM screen right there open so that everyone can, would can, could consult it, but if you do have it out on the table, then suddenly the system kind of disappears, and everyone gets to know, oh, this does that, and that does this, and everything works. So it's a it's an interesting combination of very complicated and very normal. Let's uh, take a look at one other thing to illustrate what I'm talking about. It has, uh, and I should have just bookmarked all these things, um, in the skill section, in the game system section, where is it? Um, the resistance table is how you can determine if you are trying to affect a passive thing. So for example, if you're trying to shove a boulder, then that is the active characteristic is strength, and the passive characteristic is the size of the thing that you're trying to move. And so then your percentage chance of being able to do it will change. Um, there's another table in here for... Oh, now I can't even remember what it, where it is or what it's for. Maybe it's in the combat section. Um, oh yeah, dodge results. If you don't want to parry, you want to dodge, you still have the same kinds of things that can happen. So there's a separate 5x5 five five table to help you calculate all of that. There's a massive table of fumbles, which I love, because a lot of systems that have fumbles don't really give you a table for them, and so you end up being like, you dropped your sword or you snapped your bowstring, and those are the only two fumbles that ever happened. This has a lot more than that, and it's great. Um, all of the weapons have a ton of different things they can do. And I was it's cut and thrust is the kind of weapon that I was talking about. A sword is a cut and thrust weapon. Um, bows and crossbows, armor, and armor and shields both, you know, have all kinds of things. They have hit points that you are trying to... Uh, I can't even find the other thing that I wanted to show you. But trust me, it's a complicated system, okay? It is the kind of system that we don't see too often anymore, but that has survived for a reason. It's gone through so many iterations and so many additions precisely because it works really well. And more than that, it's evocative of a certain kind of storytelling, which I really get into. So, then there's a lot of other things we could go into. There's the magic, there's the uh, the different cults and the different magic that they have, talking about all the runes. Uh, there's uh, the thing that I do want to show off is very similar, again, to Pendragon. There is a Between Adventure section. In Pendragon, this is called the Winter Phase. Here, it's just called Between Adventures or Sacred Time, which are the two weeks out of the Glaranthan year in which you just do, like, special ceremonies and stuff. Anyway, what you do in here is this is when you make experience rolls. Skills that have uh, worked really well for you. Let's look at the skill sheet. If you succeed really well with a skill during an adventure, you get to check this box and say, look, I used, for example, a dagger, and I did a really good thing with it, and so hooray for me. And then at the end of the year, when you're in this Between Adventures section, there's a chance that your dagger skill will get better because you have used it and you've learned something from it. And so that's a large part of how the experience system works. Over time, you can also increase characteristics. You can train yourself to get better at certain skills. Uh, as you age, some of your characteristics might actually get lower because you're getting so old, you're starting to get weaker, or your eyesight is worse or whatever. So once you get into sacred time, you can worship the gods, and that will give you interesting things. You can go on a hero quest if you want. There will be a harvest. This is when you do all of this stuff where you take care of your manor. That's down here on page three of the character sheet, your holdings. And so you will have a family. You will have a spouse. You will have children. You will have holdings to take care of that can give you benefits. There will be omens for how good the harvest will be or how bad the rating will be and things like that. Uh, and then 
you know, what kind of income do you get based on your occupation? And then, of course, the family roles. Do you have new children? How many new children do you have? Uh, what kind of events happen? Is there, you know, a marriage in the family or a death in the family? One of your brothers gets killed in a raid or, or gets married to someone from another clan. There's all these different things that can happen. And the reason that you go through all of this is because the game is trying to really recreate the life of the character. This is the thing I love about Pendragon, and this is the thing I love about RuneQuest, is uh, if you've heard the term murder hobo before, uh, kind of the stereotype of the Dungeons & Dragons character is that you don't have a home, you don't have a life, you don't have a family, you just wander around the countryside killing monsters. You're a murder hobo. RuneQuest doesn't have that. Because you do have a family, you do have a home, you do have a job. You're not just mindlessly going through dungeons. You're literally kind of building up your holdings. You're trying to help your family or your clan or your tribe or whatever. You're, uh, you know, going on an epic quest, but then coming back. And this is why I compared it at the beginning to something like Gilgamesh or Hercules. Hercules would go off and he would go through his big trials and then he would come home and he had a wife and he had kids, and he had an estate, and he had all of these things. And so playing through a game like this gives you that sense. And it's a very different experience if you've never done this kind of role-playing game before. Uh, I really love it. Greg Stafford is amazing at it, and RuneQuest does a fantastic job of recreating that. So, hooray for this! Uh, RuneQuest is a phenomenal game. Complex but worth the upfront investiture of time and effort on your part. Uh, especially if uh, you get a group together where everyone is excited, everyone wants to play this kind of game, everyone is invested in the rich world building and this uh, kind of cool backstory idea where you are playing not just one character but a legacy. It, it, uh, it's like nothing else out there on the market. So. Check out RuneQuest, and I will see you on my next review.